special interests that fund them to avoid reforming everything from health care to education to the banking system and energy. But how did we get where we are today? With Washington separated from voters by a wall of cold, hard, special interest cash. Take a look. In 1976, presidential candidate spending totaled $67 million, and winning House candidates spent $87,000 on average. In 2008, presidential candidates spent a total of $1.3 billion, and it cost more than $1.5 million to win a House seat. More than a billion versus 67 million for president. A million 500,000 versus $87,000 for Congress. And by 2012, spending on all the elections is projected to reach over $6 billion. Prior to the 2010 election, key industry sectors such as finance gave more to Republicans than Democrats. In 2006 and 8, it flipped with Wall Street giving more to victorious Democrats. Back before the money switch was turned Democratic in 2004, Wall Street preferred Bush to Kerry. There was so much money, the president joked about it openly. Some people call you the elite. I call you my base. <laughs> All this money had a serious impact during the financial crisis. When politicians had to vote on a $700 billion bailout to Wall Street, both parties picked donors over voters. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. It all started back in the 1970s. New television and new direct mail techniques were driving up the cost of congressional campaigns. Meanwhile, Congress was trying to control money in politics and clamp down on Nixon-era abuses. It put limits on what candidates could raise and spend. But the Supreme Court, in a 1976 decision, Buckley versus Vallejo, ruled that Congress could only limit contributions, not spending. Money, said the court, is speech. The court would continue chipping away at campaign finance regulations for years to come. Pretty soon, the first wave of television-friendly Republicans swept into office in 1978. A young Newt Gingrich saw how the fundraising vehicles called political action committees could be used to build their own power. Congressional leadership had been based on seniority, but it soon became based on fundraising prowess. And eventually, these Republicans took the majority. And we will keep our commitment to keep our half of the contract with the help of the American people. The money wave was bipartisan. In 1982, it was a congressman named Tony Coelho who brought the new business PAC money into the Democratic Party. By 2002, the situation was so outrageous that Senator John McCain and Senator Russ Feingold were able to pass a bill to restrict contributions to the political parties. But this opened up a loophole for, quote, soft money to go directly to outside groups. By 04, there was so much money in politics that massive donations from individual billionaires, T. Boone Pickens on the right, George Soros on the left, had turned politics into a sport for billionaires. And in 2010, the Supreme Court, in a controversial decision called Citizens United, gutted most remaining campaign finance restrictions, saying that corporations and unions could put unlimited sums of money directly into elections. The Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. And today, a new area, uh, an era of unlimited billions spent in secret to advocate and destroy for politicians around specific policies to the point where each and every piece of legislation virtually has its own price tag on it, each chairmanship, each congressional seat. Think of it like a big box store. This is not a democracy. This is an auction for power. The debate is shaped and controlled by well-moneyed forces that are never on the ballot. And here with us, Washington insider and lobbyist turned money and politics whistleblower, the very courageous and very impassioned Jimmy Williams. <laughs> also with us, Paul Jorgensen, one of the foremost political scientists in the area of money and politics. He currently is serving as a fellow at the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard, and it is a pleasure to welcome both of you to the conversation. Professor Jorgensen, why is this not a issue or an issue, why is this capital T the issue? Well, simply because uh, 
every form of, of corruption in our society must come to politics and to, to voice grievances. And so if your measure of accountability uh, is in itself uh, somewhat corrupt or have an improper dependency on cash, then uh, the, the, the voice of the people is not going to be heard in, in Congress. Hasn't money always been a part of politics? Oh, of course, of course, but uh, we need to remind the people that uh, campaign finance regulation, in fact, is relatively new, and we've actually made some strides. So Buckley v. Vallejo, in your intro, what it also did is upheld a lot of the limits and disclosure laws and regulatory enforcement of uh, campaign donations. And so we need to protect of what, what we've already accomplished and then uh, continue to fight further. Yeah, uh, Jimmy, uh, you and I have spoken at length about the First Amendment's protection of lobbying the right to address your government. We've also spoken at length about the bastardization of that profession into the so-called lobbyist fundraiser where your ability to influence is no longer based on your ability to advocate policy but on your ability to either raise money for or against a given politician. How does this actually work and how does it play out in the conversion of our democracy from a democracy to an auction for power? Well, let me go back. You, when you introed me, uh, you called me a whistleblower. I, 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 that's very kind of you, except I don't think I've blown the whistle. I think that most people in America, and especially people in Washington, D.C., have known that this is the sick game that we've been playing for, uh, for decades. So I'm not really a whistleblower. I'm just kind of fed up. To answer your question, however, uh, listen, it's simple. Politicians by nature are not corrupt. Lobbyists by nature are not corrupt. There are always going to be uh, low-hanging fruit. You're going to have the Mark Foley's of the world or the Jack Abramoff's of the world. But by and large, most politicians, per se, federal politicians, are not corrupted individuals. They are, however, operating in a corrupt system, a system where under no circumstances should anybody in America think that a single piece of legislation that takes place in, building, in the building behind me, and that's a live shot of our Capitol right now, by the way, with nobody in it, but not a single piece of legislation is not affected by how much you get as a congressman or a senator from the very interests that are affected by that legislation and by how much they give you. So it's not a new system. It is not um, a system that, uh, that is serving the American people. Most members of Congress, I would probably uh, uh, suspect, spend at least half of their day either at a breakfast, a lunch, or a dinner fundraiser, or if they, don't, if they don't have a committee hearing, they'll go across the street to their party committees, they'll get on the phone and they'll dial for dollars. Wouldn't it be nice if a majority or all of our members of Congress and senators, instead of spending 50% of their time dialing for dollars, instead spent the other 50% on the floor of the Senate or the House actually legislating, making deals with the other side of the aisle, listening to each other, talking to each other, and affecting policy instead of having fundraisers do it for them? If you were to look at how determinative, determinative this is, Professor Jorgensen, if an individual raises more money, what are the odds that the person who has the most money will actually achieve the desired outcome of whether it's electoral victory or legislative? Oh, it's, I mean, pretty well. It, it's hard to tease out the causal arrows. That's always been the problem in, in political science. But those who've had, uh, you know, good research designs and have teased out these causal arrows, controlled for the methodology, we do find that what money can do is buy lots of time, effort, and committee meetings. And uh, also, over time, if you look at incumbents, uh, they do switch their votes and sometimes it's correlated with the cash. Uh, if you look at the data in 08, it says 93% of the winners in 08 raised more money than their opponent. It says Obama outraised McCain by two to one. Uh, Obama raised 39 million in 08 alone from finance and Wall Street. A 93% that sounds pretty de determinative uh, to me, uh, Jimmy. How much is there a quid pro quo between money and legislative outcomes? Well, let's be clear. A quid pro quo is illegal under federal law. However, an implicit uh, or implied uh, quid pro quo is not. And I don't, th again, I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that all 535 members of the House and the, and the Senate are crooks. They're not, uh, despite what many of the American people think. They are not. They're honorable people. However, 
And when you sit around and spend half of your day asking people for money and their opinions while you're asking them for money about legislation, there's absolutely no way you can separate those two issues. You cannot separate the money from politics. And why in God's name would they? The Supreme Court has made it remarkably clear in decision after decision after decision that money is speech under the First Amendment. And the only way, I don't care, Buckley, it doesn't matter what the, the legislation is. The court, the Supreme Court is never going to allow a ban, an outright ban on money and politics unless the American people demand it by a constitutional amendment. Well, and that, so it's just that simple. Yeah, and I'm going to leave it there. And that is exactly what we are working on, a constitutional amendment and a petition to go with it uh, to escalate the loudness of the volume of this conversation using every possible resource, not the least of which collaboration with every one of our viewers and readers. Jimmy, thank you so much for your thank time you. today. Professor Jorgensen, uh, we thank, thank you. you.